Es ist Freitag, 13.10 Uhr. Los geht's mit einer neuen Episode von Mats ab Vollbart nachgefragt. Der neue Interview-Podcast für den guten Zweck. Von und mit Matze Theo. Vorhang auf für Mats ab! That I thought was very touching is that at the funeral, uh, when we were in Berlin, mm-hmm. after we buried Marlena and everything, my mother went over to her grandmother's grave and said to her, now that you have her back, teach her how to love. Marlena seeing Princess Margaret at, in Drury Lane at the end of her performance, Princess Margaret curtsied to Marlena before Marlena could curtsy to her. But Matthias, Marlena doesn't belong to me. Marlena belongs to her fans. Mats ab. Vollbart nachgefragt ist noch ein neuer Interview-Podcast. Es kommen Leute zu Wort, die Matze Theo, das bin ich, interessant findet und die vorher noch nie die Gelegenheit hatten, ihre spannenden Geschichten zu erzählen. Zehn Fragen? Naja, also fünf. Oh, noch fünf? Ja, also zehn in Summe. Oh, egal. Im Anschluss an das Gespräch verabreden sich beide zu einer guten Tat. Matz ab, Erika Diewitt. Salut und bienvenue. Hello everybody. Herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Ausgabe von Mats ab Feuerbad nachgefragt und diese Woche wirklich mit einem ganz besonderen Gast. Und ich dachte mir, wieso nicht einmal einen Kindheitstraum erfüllen und mal was Neues ausprobieren. Und ich werde dieses Interview auf Englisch führen. Also, holt eure Vokabelhefte raus, aktiviert eure Online-Übersetzer und los geht's. It is a really great honor to welcome a very special guest here today. And in a moment, everything will become clear why I'm doing this Mats Up interview in English. My guest is an agent, a producer, and author of books, including Murder on Safari, The Path, Kidnapped on Safari, and The Berlin Package. He is also the son of actress and writer Maria Riva and the grandson of famous Hollywood actress Marlene Dietrich, or as we would say in Germany, Marlene Dietrich. We will welcome from Berlin, Germany to the United States of America, to New Mexico, to Mr. Peter Riva. Thanks, Matthias. <laughs> nice to be with you. Thanks so very much and I'm very excited and thanks for accepting my invitation and for all the new listeners and that's more than 330 million potential listeners from the States, I briefly explain the unique and yet complicated concept of my podcast. I kindly ask you to work out five questions in advance that you have never been asked before and that you would like to answer in the best case. And I also prepared and will ask you five questions, assuming that you have never been asked them either. If there is a question that you have already answered at some point in older interviews or you find boring or something else, you have the opportunity <laughs> to find, you have the opportunity to decide for which good cause I should get involved. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> sure, why not? So it's you can ask anything you like. I have no problem. <laughs> I saw that in your questions, and I'm very, uh, yeah, curious. I'm, I'm very happy, and uh, yeah, and I think we don't need to introduce Malili Dietrich uh, anymore. But nevertheless, I would like to explain some short info. Malena seems so interesting for me because her life is a, a testimony for the last century. So she was born in 1901 here in Berlin, Schöneberg, and died in 92 in Paris. And uh, still almost 30 years after her death, I think Marlene is, especially here in Berlin, very present. And I think also in Hollywood and uh, or in America and all over the world. And for me, she is fascinating, less as an actress, but as a personality. And I think a cert- um, certainly a complicated one. When I talk or think about her, I think in three stages, like the Sternbergs, Marlene before the war and the soldier Marlene at the war because uh, where she did an amazing thing at the front and Marlene as an entertainer after the war. So you had been with Marlene for 42 years, I think, as a grandson. And when she passed away, I was 42. 42, yes, right. And uh, I look forward 
to your stories and your insight and uh, about you and your family, of course. And I'm very curious if I be able to ask you unique questions. So let's start with your questions. And I invite you to get lost in every detail because yeah, I'm excited. Your first question, Mr. Weaver, is how many directors have you talked with about making a biography movie on Marlene? Um, dozens. Um, <laughs> but um, the weird thing is my mother wrote a biography on her mother. And as Marlena said, by the way, and it was published letter from Marlena, that there's only one person who knows the truth, and that's Maria. And she knew that Maria was going to uh, be able to write the truth because of two reasons. One, Marlena and Poppy, my grandfather, trained Maria always to remember what was said when and who. She trained um, her. She trained her, yes. Oh. Even in Berlin when she was a child, before she did the Blue Angel, um, my mother would uh, be in a Victorian way. It's not a child abuse way, but in a Victorian way, mm -hmm. she would be brought to speak to guests who were coming to the house. You know, so my mother would meet Eric Palmer or meet von Sternberg later on and so on. And um, later on, when she was being put to bed, my grandfather or my grandmother would go to her and say, now, what did they say? Exactly what they said. What, what were they meaning? And she, my mother was trained from a very early age to be Marlena's secretary, essentially, private personal secretary. And my mother knew everything about everybody and so on. There was an interesting story that um, the people at the Deutsche Kinematik can, can confirm. Mm -hmm. When Maria finished writing the book in November 1990, um, it was then put in a vault. Now, Marlena was still alive, and people always say, well, why didn't Maria share it with Marlena and everything else? And my mother's answer for that was very sensible. She says, I'm not into punishment. Marlena didn't wow. need to face the truth in her life. She knew it was there. She, Marlena was never a liar. She just um, preferred not to be faced with some of the realities that were in every life. In every single life, there are things that you regret. And they're sure. important in a biography, but they're not important to, to abrade somebody, to, to punish somebody with. So my mother and the publishers in New York agreed, and, and Klaus Eck, who at the time was at Bertelsmann, they all agreed, put the, the book away until Marlene is passed, and then we'll publish it. By the way, my mother did the translation in German with Klaus Eck, one-on-one. -on -one. And Claudia, that, v yes. and, yes. and Claudia Vidoni. And yeah. so the, the German is the best translation. The French translation isn't bad. The Italian translation is, eh. The, the, uh, the English is exactly as mom wrote it. Not one word changed. Because your mother wrote it in English, obviously. Correct. Yes. By hand. In handwriting. By hand. Ah, okay. Yeah. My mother would write during the day. My father would type at night. And then she, he would give her the pages to edit in the morning. And they did this for six months. Now, um, it's important that people understand the accuracy of the book. My mother had dialogue in the book from the 30s, for example. Mm -hmm. And the publisher said, well, it's, you know, we'll just have to take your word for it, Maria, that it's accurate because you have such a great memory and so on. What they didn't know and what Werner Sudendorf found out and the people at the Deutsche Kinematik found out later. When Marlena passed away, my job was to reunite the eight storage bins around the world, one in Paris, one in LA, one in Jersey, one in New York, so on and so forth. The ones in Paris had been put in storage in 1939 in wooden crates sealed up with nails. In 39? In 39, when they were leaving France in a hurry. Wow. Okay. So that storage was there and nobody had opened it. That had all the letters that Maria wrote as dialogue, but Maria never saw those letters because her she had a photographic memory, an eidetic memory, my mother. So she was able to put dialogue of what was in the letters. It, it's it, because at the time there were, weren't a lot of phone calls. You know, the modern mm -hmm. generation doesn't understand that even, even I, when I lived in England, um, when I first got married in 72, if I wanted to call somebody in Spain, I had to book the call a day ahead of time. Tell mm -hmm. the operator I'd like to speak to so and so, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a day later that I'd get connected. Back in the 30s, it could be never, and so you sent a telegram or you sent letters, and so the letters were long letters. I mean, you know, there were letters from 
lovers and so on and so forth, you know, that were 10, 15 pages long because it's like a conversation. It, it, you just do it in writing. So my mother used that in the book. So all the dialogue in the book turns out to be extracted from letters or from conversations that Maria witnessed herself. And and that that accuracy is a great thing. Now, you asked me a question of directors. Um, yes. My mother's biography is a serious work on the preeminent art form of the 20th century as seen through the career of Marlene Dietrich. A lot of film history professors are using my mother's book as a signpost of what it was really like to be in the studio system and so on. <clears throat> now, when the book was published, when Marlene had passed and the book was published, a lot of directors were interested right away. The one who was most interested was Louis Mal. And Louis Mal would have been a brilliant director. Mm -hmm. No question. We had meetings with him. He was great. He hired a writer. And the writer wrote a first script. It was absolutely terrible. It was so bad that Louis Mal sent a letter to my mother, said, don't worry, c'est abominable. It's, it's abominable. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I know him. We'll rewrite it 10 times. Um, and, and that's okay. That's the, the process in Hollywood. But Louis Mal said, as a biopic, a picture that is de destined for the purpose of... Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know this was on. I beg your pardon. No problem. I hope it's not your mother. <laughs> trying to turn it off. So Louis Mal um, felt that the story of Marlena, for him, that was the most interesting, because a biopic is only so long. You can't do, you know, 80 years of a life yes. in a movie. It just doesn't work. I see. Mm -hmm. For him, the important thing was Marlena last film with von Sternberg, the studio gets rid of her Svengali, her, the man who made her what she was. Mm -hmm. What they didn't realize is that von Sternberg didn't make Marlena who she was. Marlena was exactly who she wanted to be. What she was doing was learning from von Sternberg how to make that the best possible visually. See. Then taking control of her own career after Louis Malle, having a mirror there so she could look at herself and take absolute control of everything she appeared in to maintain continuity of the image. She understood image perfectly. Why? Because she came from, I would say, nobility of a certain sense. People say, oh, her father was a policeman. N no, he was in the Royal Guard. That's a whole different category. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not a policeman. Yeah, he had a uniform because he was the second son And as the second son, he wasn't the head of the family, so therefore they had to get him a job that he could do. So the the thing is, Louis Mal felt that the story of Marlena sh in a movie should be from 1935 to her war career and end the movie on her first um, big, uh, not cabaret, but theater performance in front of the soldiers, the boys. So are we talking about that famous Las Vegas show where she started her concert career? Or do you mean other shows in particular? Vegas could have been considered the first, but it didn't really matter which one it was. It was that was the end of the movie. The very end would have been the, rolling the credits over her performance. I see. Okay. Uh, so that for him, it was this woman who took control of her life, who then devoted that control by forcing the army. And she had to force the army to let her go to the European theater. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, they wanted to send her to the Pacific. <clears throat> She says, I don't speak any of those languages. I speak German. I can go to the front. Yes. I can broadcast messages in German. I can help win the war as best I can. And I'll entertain the troops at the same time. So for, for Louis Mal, that was the story. The problem is Louis Mal died in the middle of, of working on all this. He passed away. Oh, so. so we went, okay, that's a disaster. So um, the next person who got interested was Steven Spielberg. And I spent mm -hmm. about three years with Steven Spielberg working on the project from various angles and everything. Steven is a very busy guy. I met him first when I was 19. Um, Steven used to, he was at USC. I was at UCLA. He was a little older than me. And he would come to UCLA and um, he was always perpetually broke like most students. <laughs> and so he would bet anybody at UCLA that he could name every credit of any movie that they could think of because he also has an eidetic memory. And so wow. they would bet him, you know, a dollar, 25 cents, whatever. And at the end of the time, he had enough to go and buy pizza. 
That was his pizza money. <laughs> so it's not just the humor that he is such a nerd and those kind of things. He know he can tell you the key grip on a movie made in 1932. I mean, it's it's a little weird, but it's it's his passion. And, That's and yeah, my brother, yeah. right. my brother worked with Stephen on a few pictures, and they loved each other, and it was a a meeting of the minds. Anyway, Stephen should have made the movie. The problem is his company was taken over by this company, then taken over by another, and the DreamWorks went somewhere else, and so it all sort of fell apart. The next one was, uh, I mean, there were other interested directors in between, but let, mm -hmm. forget that. I mean, Vils Meyer and all those people. Eesh. Please don't let's talk about that film because I don't understand it. So I no, think I mean, it's just it's silly. Uh, he, silly, great actress. I think it's a remarkable and a lovely person. Lovely person. Katja Flint is absolutely amazing, but the story I don't get it at all. So uh, it's yeah. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. came up with this character that Marlena really, really loved Germany, and there was a good German soldier. I mean, it's just silly. Anyway, so so the next person was Pedro Almodovar. Now the idea of Pedro Almodovar to a movie about Marlena later would have been very interesting and Pedro and I spent some time talking on the phone and his brother was extremely nice it's funny that Louis Mal's brother and Pedro's brother both anyway so we had interesting conversations and I think that uh, Pedro would have been the right person mm -hmm. we even signed contracts to do it and everything out of MGM London the problem with Pedro was that he didn't feel he had the command of English and to, to at that time And now he could, but at the time he couldn't. So that's where we're at. And we're now, I think, and forget the others. There's a few others. There's one, uh, um, there's a very nice guy in, in Germany who's working on the picture at the moment. And um, yeah, with Diane Kruger, right? It's like a TV series. And Diane Kruger is wonderful. There's she no, is. She is. She, she's great. And, and I think that um, I'm waiting for them to actually make an announcement that they're doing something. Because at the moment it's it's like pulling teeth. I can't get anybody to. Oh, I thought they were shooting right now because I read about in some areas in Hamburg there are some complaints because the production went some fabrics and office buildings and the residents had to move out. So I don't know. Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't got a script yet. Um, they're working on it, you know. But don't forget Fatih Akin, who's the director for this thing. He's a talented individual, very talented. And once they get a script that I think is um, closer to, you know, the weird thing about Marlena is everybody makes up this bullshit about her for no reason. The truth is always much better than fiction when it comes to Marlena, because the truth is yes. really interesting. It's dense. Yes. My mother yes. calls it the chinchilla syndrome, you know, <laughs> it, it, because what happens in and, and this has happened, you know, everywhere around the world. People say to my mother, and this is my mother's example, oh, I saw Marlena come into the Four Seasons restaurant wearing a chinchilla coat, and she just looked fantastic. Marlena would never wear a dead rat for a coat. She just wouldn't. Not going to happen. It would be Givenchy wool tailored properly. It might be uh, an ermine coat at the right season, mm -hmm. but chinchilla <laughs> but see in their head there's this aura of marlena so they create this vision of incredible i mean the swans down coat on the stage yes works people don't realize why she wore the swans down, swans down coat it's because she in her outfit looked semi-nude the swans down coat was extremely light the whole if you pick up the swans down coat If it weighs 600, 700 grams, I'd be interested. Oh, wow. Really? That famous one coat looks like, I don't know, 10 kilos or something. It's it maybe a kilo total, you know. It's very enough. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, we can successfully make a, a picture uh, with Fatih Akin. Um, yeah. There, there's some interest in Hollywood in doing a motion picture. He's doing a television thing. Yeah. I'm waiting to see a script that, you know, anybody can approve. If they're filming at all, I have no idea what they're filming. They haven't told me. They may be doing trials. They may be doing tests. You know, I, I don't know. I thought they have to ask you or to have to show you something. Uh, yeah. And I haven't seen that yet. I see. Okay. Wow. I mean, they have an agreement. They have an option to make it. That's that's which is important because I think she's very talented. 
And I think she could do a good job. But of course, you it's, know, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Okay, thank you. In my opinion, it's not about the actress, Diane Kruger, who plays Marlena. It's about the storyline, the whole story about a life of the last century, which Marlena was part of. I mean, you know, they're, they're doing a multi-part television thing. And, and therefore, they're going to cover a lot more territory and a lot more ground, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I kind of preferred Louis Malle's version because the strength of the woman, the intelligence of the woman is what is really interesting. There's nothing that Marlena ever did that wasn't intelligent. There's nothing that Marlena ever did that wasn't carefully thought out. Yes, it, it may have been natural thinking. It may have been her, her upbringing and everything else, you know, flicht. You know, the, the woman believes yes. in responsibility right to her core. Yes. Um, and, yes. and if you're going to do it, you do it right or don't do it at all. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, somebody said to me recently, why the hell did she ever perform on stage when she broke her arm? She strapped it to her side. Why did she do that? Because she'd made a commitment to these people who are going to sit in the theater and watch her sing. So she she performed a little bit of pain, a little discomfort. That's That's her problem, not there. That's the mentality of the woman. Now, to see Marlena talk to people like Alexander Lieberman, uh, to uh, Hemingway, to uh, Eric Maria Remarque, to Harold Arlen, to mm -hmm. Bert Bacharach, people in their it. own right who are extremely yeah. creative, yeah. and see them act like children to her because she was a superior intellect to them and they knew it as a child when you see that you go wow this is somebody who commands the respect of people who are at the pinnacle of their artistic and intellectual capability i remember alexander fleming um did an interview in britain uh, it's a thing in britain that they do called the uh, desert island discs And on Desert Island Discs, she, she said that the woman interviewing him said, you know, mm -hmm. because you invented penicillin, you've met all these wonderful people in your life and everything else. He said, oh, yeah, Marlena was the best of all. <laughs> you know, it, it's weird. I mean, it's weird. When I Gorbachev it. was um, under house arrest in Georgia, mm -hmm. um, Marlena was furious. She was phoning everybody, Ronald Reagan, everybody else. She was phoning everybody and putting pressure on them to stop this nonsense. And when he got out, he, he, his office called her to thank her. This is an aging woman in, in, in her apartment in Paris. Yes. Gorbachev is thanking. Nancy Reagan called me. I love that story. I love that story. Yeah. Two days after they left the White House saying, is Marlene all right? I called and I got a maid and, and then she wouldn't put me through. And I said, yeah, I knew that it wasn't a maid it was marlena pretending to be a maid i okay that's that's something she we all knew that yeah and so but nancy reagan said you know the last phone call ronnie made from the white house was to marlena and i go to myself the most powerful man in the world the last phone call he makes is to yeah. your grandmother exactly yeah so and that isn't because she was famous that isn't because she had fans because an aging woman in bed in paris has hardly got a fan base anymore she's not making movies It's because of her intellect, because mm -hmm. of the respect these people had for her intellect. She saw the truth straight and narrow. She was never against Germans, never against Germany. She was against the Nazis. Today, she'd be against Trump with the same lawyers for focus, against Putin, same focus. All these authoritarian people that. who are fascists, she'd yes. be totally against yeah. them. Why? Because the individual rights of man are being suborned. And she realized that at the time mm -hmm. early on. You know, a lot of people don't know that in the 30s, she saw what was coming. That's why she never went back to Berlin. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. all say, well, she left for Hollywood. She never came back. She never came back because she knew it wasn't safe mm -hmm. for her to come back. Mm -hmm. And she kind of she was always polite to von Ribbentrop and these other people who were trying to get her to come back to Germany because she didn't want to anger them because then they'd take it out on her mother. And her sister and still your grandfather was still back in uh, Berlin, right? And in Paris at that time. He left. She made him leave in 33 or 35. Um, oh, he went okay. to America and then he went to Paris. He never left Paris. He worked for Paramount in Paramount, Paris. Yes. He was mm -hmm. doing the dubbing directing. He I see. Okay. director of dubbing movies. Um, and... The thing is, Marlena would come back to Paris and she would phone up. Now, you have to understand, America at that time, 
we had a law in that in the country at that time that you couldn't come to America unless you had a unique job, a mm -hmm. unique capability. Mm -hmm. So Peter Lorre had no problem bringing Peter Lorre over, no problem billing Billy Wilder over because they were artists and they had a unique capability. But the guy who's operating the camera, who's doing the lights, who's pulling cables, these people, they're not unique and they couldn't get a permit to leave. And remember, Ufa was being purged of Jewish people at that time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And. And Marlena knew it. Everybody knew it. Robbie Lance told me that he was totally in cahoots with Marlena to try and find out who and where and who's in more danger. So she'd go to Paris and she'd phone somebody up and say, you know, I remember when I was making movies there, you were so nice to me and everything. And I have some money and I'd love to see you in Paris. Will you come and visit me? And this man or this woman who answered the phone would say, yeah, but we don't have them. Oh, no, I'll send you tickets. Bring your family. We'll have a little get, get together. And these people, husband, wife, two children, will get on a train, go to Paris. And there was Marlena at the, the Gare de Lyon, Gare de l'Est, Gare de l'Est. She was there in the morning, six o'clock when the night train came, hands them two suitcases full of food, a package of money and said, keep going. That's amazing. Keep going to Portugal. Yeah. Keep going right through Spain, all the way to Portugal. Mm -hmm. She knew a war was coming. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew a war was coming. They just didn't know when. And and so I don't know. You know, my mother asked her once, how many people do you think that you helped? She says, I don't know whether they did go or just took went back to Germany. I couldn't control that, she said. But I don't know. Poppy and I, I don't know, 12, 15 people, families, you know, just to help. Yes. Because you do what you yeah. can. It's amazing. So as far as a biography is concerned and making a movie, you know, I, I hope, um, I, I sincerely hope that Fatih does a good job. I mean, he's a talented guy. And we all do. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, let's hope that goes well. Now, the second question on my list was. Which was your favorite director? Maybe two or three. <laughs> <laughs> did you already answer it? <laughs> I sort of did. But, you know, if, if I had, if, if I had, a, you know, you can't control Hollywood and the money and everything else. But if, sure. I, if I had, uh, there's a guy called Frank who made a wonderful, wonderful movie called The Queen's Gambit. If you haven't seen The Queen's Gambit on, on Netflix, I urge you to see it. We all did. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. But, you know, most people don't realize what he did. He's a, obviously a film history student because what he did, as the timeline changes, and remember it's the 60s, as it changes, the camera angles, the lighting, and the montage all change according to what time you're in. So at one point when you're watching The Queen's Gambit, there's split screens like the Thomas Crown Affair because suddenly we're 1969. He used... The, the visual techniques of the actual years that he was filming. I mean, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That's brilliant. And at the, stop... at the end, the last scene where they're playing chess and it's claustrophobic mm -hmm. and it's that room with all the people mm -hmm. and everything, straight out of The Godfather. <laughs> 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 that I mean, be... it's, a, it's, a it's a brilliant piece of work. I mean, it is a truly brilliant piece of work from every aspect, the acting, the people, the thing. I mean, just wonderful. The the woman who played the mother is a great director in her own right. By the way, she she's um, she's got a wonderful vi visual acuity. So yeah, if I had my choice currently, I'd choose Frank. So of course, um, Stephen uh, Stephen would be ideal. You know, my mother and I we worked with Michael Winner for a while because after Louis Ma, we thought Michael would take it, and he would have done something as usual, either absolutely wonderful or eh. And since this wasn't being forced on him, it would have been wonderful. And mm -hmm. we sat in this last meeting with him and he said, you know, I've been thinking about this over the weekend and I've come to the realization that I could spend the rest of my life trying to figure out why I'm German. I don't want to do that. Wow. Okay. Because mm -hmm. he realized to tell the story of Marlena, you had to explain what it is to be German. Exactly. Yeah. And he didn't want to yeah. do the self analysis that would be required. So he passed. Oh, I understand. That's why I said at the beginning of our interview, it's not about, it's not just about the actress, Marlene. It's about her personality, her character. It's about the fact that she was 
from Berlin, left Germany and uh, became an American citizen, lost her Paramount studio contract, stood against Nazi Germany and after the war created a new career, many careers, multiple careers and uh, becoming such a remarkable and complicated character. So you talked about the book already and let's... Yeah, yeah, but I want to tell you something. Yeah, of course. So mom... Um, You know, I am a literary agent, but I have large projects. And mom thought, you know, she better start writing this. And we're back in 1979 now. In 79, she thought, I better start writing this down while I still can. Because she said, you know, it's going to take me four or five years to write the book. <laughs> and and she says, I got to drain my memory of everything. So I said, yes, that's a good idea, mom. She says, well, Swifty Lazar, who is a big Hollywood agent, approached my mother and said, I can get you a lot of money for the biography, it, Maria, you write the book. And she said, okay. So mom, you know, w met with Michael Corda at Simon and Schuster and everything else. And Simon Schuster said, Maria, you've never written a book. Um, you have a great voice, you have wonderful memory, but here's the Boyers, Mr. and Mrs. Boyers, who could write the book with you and they're wonderful to collaborate with. And the Boyers were very nice and they're great. And they spent, a thousand hours or more interviewing my mother and making notes and recordings and everything else. And, um, you know, it got a little bit by 1981, it was clear that what the Boyers were writing were just another celebrity, you know, hatchet job. And my mother finally read one of the proofs that they wrote in which they said Hemingway and Marlena met on the Normandy and the boat rocked all night. And my mother went, what? Okay. It rocked on the, so they're making a sexual thing, but there is no sex, but they can't say that. Eh, the people want to think there's sex. Mom said, that's bullshit. I'm not writing bullshit. So she went to the publisher and the publisher said, tough shit. We've got the rights to do it. The Boyers have written a manuscript. We love it. And Swifty Lazar said, Maria, you're crazy. I'm going to make a great movie out of this. You'll make a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. And so my mother phone, phones me up and she says, D do you think you could get involved in just talking to Swifty Lazar and getting him on my side. He is my agent. So Swifty invited me to the Oscars party. He always had a big Oscars party. And I flew out to LA. I went to the Oscars party. He wouldn't talk to me. He was busy with other people, which I thought he would have been. Mm -hmm. The next day I spoke with him and he said, well, what do you want? I said, you know what, Swifty, you're not really interested in this. And Maria is never going to approve the bullshit of this book. And frankly, we'll just take her name off of it. And he slams the phone down on me. So then I got a phone call from Michael Corda, Simon Schuster. What's this I hear you, you're, you're threatening to take Maria's name off the book? I said, well, the book is so much bullshit. She's not going to promote it. So just take her name off. You can do it as a biography from the Boyers, you know, um, and uh, we'll just say that Maria has nothing to do with it. And he says, well, I can't sell it without Maria's name. So we got into a wrangle. Swifty Lazar quit. I negotiated a deal from my mother. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mom, I need 60 or 70 pages from you in your voice. And Marlena was still alive, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is 19. Uh, this is the 60 pages was in 80. The 80s, yeah. No, I'm thinking 87. Mm -hmm. 80, yeah, 87. So mm -hmm. Mom writes 66 pages and they're brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And so I, I take that into Simon and Schuster and we have a big meeting and Dick Snyder was the president of Simon and Schuster at the time and Michael Corda and, and Nancy, Dick Snyder's wife and my mother and I, and Dick Snyder says, Michael, did you read the material? And Michael said, yeah, no, it's, it's good, but it's, you know, it's too thick. It's too Hollywood. And Nancy says, as a woman, I'm telling you, this is the book that all women are going to want to read. This is the truth, the reality. It's, absolutely perfect mm -hmm. and dick snyder calls his wife the c word in front of us my mother stands oh. up and walks out of the room and i'm sitting there and I, i i look at nancy and i look at dick and i look at michael gordon and i say you guys want out of this contract they said yeah but you got to come up with the money that we paid i said no problem so i i, I went right away to vicky wilson at knopf and i said vicky read the 66 pages give me a check for eight hundred thousand dollars i'm buying simon and schuster out and the book will be a knopf book And she said, good, done deal. <laughs> so there we were, um, 88, and between 88 and um, 
88 and November 90, my mother finished the book. And, and that's the book you see. I think it's the perfect time now to come to your third question because it's so on point here. You already answered it at the beginning, but let me read your question. It's very interesting. Is it true Malenia knew Maria's book was being written? And if so, why didn't Maria share it with her? Because it would have hurt Marlena to read some of the truth. You know, in my life, I've made some mistakes that I don't like looking at anymore. I mean, they're, they're painful to re to remember things that went badly or mm -hmm. I should have done that better or I I could have been kinder, you know, or whatever. You know, we all make mistakes. And Marlena made three big mistakes in her life, um, according to my mother. Just three. That's not so bad. One of which um, she didn't stand up to Poppy forcing Tamara to have abortion after abortion. You know, Poppy, being a Catholic, didn't believe in contraception. And therefore, Tamara kept on getting pregnant and kept on being sent away to have an abortion. And after her third or fourth abortion, it It damaged her. So mom never really was very happy. She was angrier at Poppy than Marlena. But the truth is Marlena had a hand in it. She, she allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was uh, there was a woman who was put in charge of my mother at a time when a young girl shouldn't have a, a, an overly aggressive um adult, male or female, put in charge of them without any other control. Marlena was away. She was busy with Fairbanks and so on. And um, and a remark at the time. And this woman raped my mother. And it was interesting because we did a, a tour in Germany and there was a NDR talk show in which the, the man interviewing my mother said, well, how can a woman rape a woman? And my mother looked at him and she says, you don't understand that rape's about violence and control. Mm -hmm. It's not sexual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, well, she was a lesbian, so it's sexual. She says, no, that's her sexual preference, but that's nothing to do with it. It's all about control and violence. Exactly. The yeah. next morning, we were at Hamburg Airport, and we sit down to have a coffee at the little bars that they have there. Mm -hmm. And my mother has a coffee, and I had tea. And the, I said, can I pay? And she says, no, no, I can't take your money. My mother says, no, no, don't be silly. You know, because a woman had recognized my mother from TV the night before. And my mother said, we must pay. You know, and my mother speaks Ochdeutsch. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. I know. <laughs> my, mo my mother was saying, you know, really, we should pay. It's not fair to you. She says, no, you don't understand. And the woman breaks into tears. And she says, all my life, I've carried this, that I was raped by my stepmother. And I could never explain to anybody that a woman could rape me. And, and you publicly took away my shame. And I thought, you know, I mean, it, but we missed our flight. Mom and she were crying together. I mean, it was the most emotional thing. Mm. People are so stupid about this. Unbelievable. There, there's a, there's a, um, an LGBT uh, group that said that my mother's book is homophobic because she refites, writes about the woman who is a, a, um, a lesbian dyke. And my mother uses the word dyke as, as a form of power, not as a form of sexual preference. Mom doesn't give a damn about sexual preference, never has. But what was in there they didn't understand that the rape was not about sex. They didn't get the topic. Yeah. Violence mm -hmm. and control. And Marlena mm -hmm. should have known better because you can't say Marlena was naive. You can't say that she couldn't understand the dynamics and they couldn't understand the, the dangers that she put her daughter in at, a, at an impressionable age. You know, a young girl, um, yeah. you know, how old was she? 15, 16. So, you know, there's there some mistakes Marlena made. And the other one, that I thought was very touching is that at the funeral, um, when we were in Berlin, mm -hmm. after we buried Marlena and everything, my mother went over to her grandmother's grave and said to her, now that you have her back, teach her how to love. That's really sad. Wow. Yeah, no, because I, it, you know, mom didn't blame Marlena for that. See, this is the thing. She's not saying Marlena was bad because she didn't know how to love. It's that the, 1901, the father who is screwing anything that moves and has this marriage of convenience, then he dies from syphilis. Then the stepfather, wartime, everything. I mean, mm -hmm. 
there was no time for her to develop a relationship mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. which she learned the true meaning of love. And the Victorian family that she was in, holy cow, pretty yes. much discipline. So I think that the story of my mother and Marlena is one that is, people always say, oh, doesn't your mother, didn't she love her mother? Yes, she loved her mother. But it wasn't a normal mother-daughter relationship because that isn't the way Marlena was brought up. And that wasn't the way that she treated Maria. Maria Obviously. was her, yeah. her companion, her confidant. Yeah. Yeah. But from my perspective, what is really interesting here is that there's a difference between your mother and your grandmother, right? Because they are from the same family. Your mother was born in Berlin, so she's from Germany too. She was born in 1924, but she's a whole different character. She is able to love as a woman and as a mother. So that seems to be, I don't know, strange or interesting. You know, my mother being an intellect, um, said I had to choose whether I was going to learn by example or learn by the wrong example. And I chose to learn from my mother how not to be. This is very reflected and this is very, yeah, very wise. Okay, I see. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example of my mother. Here's a perfect example because it came up the other day here in America. People were talking about the homeless people on the street and everything Mm -hmm. else and that they should be put in jail or some bullshit. My mother, when she lived in Manhattan in the uh, in the 80s, um, she would go to McDonald's and buy gift vouchers. And when people on the street were begging, she would give them a gift voucher for food. Mm-hmm. She'd go back to McDonald's and the, Mac- the manager at the McDonald's said, we're not selling you any more gift vouchers. My mother said, really? Why? Well, because you give them to people off the street and they come in and they're dirty and they use the bathroom and We don't want them in here. My mother said, oh, really? Good. Let me just call ABC, NBC, and CBS television crews to come down here, and you do the interview with me that you don't want to sell me gift vouchers that you're making a profit on because you don't like the people who come in to buy hamburgers. Needless to say, my mother kept on buying vouchers, and she still does to this day. She's 96, and when she goes out, she she buys gift vouchers at Chipotle now because that's closer to her in Palm Springs. Yeah. She buys gift vouchers and she gives it off to anybody who's begging on the street. She won't give them money for booze or anything else. She'll give them food. Great. And she's safe and healthy. Yes, she's okay. Yeah, she's, you know, she's <laughs> when you're 96, you're slower. But as she says every day when I talk to her, she says, you know, what the hell am I still here for? I'm not doing anything concrete. I said, Mom, just being here is good enough. <laughs> being here is good. Yeah. Talking about all of your grandsons, you have three brothers. Did Marlene have a favorite grandson? If so, who and why? Definitely Michael. Michael was the, the firstborn. He was also the most elegant and the, the, the most handsome. I was a bit of a schlemiel, you know, a big guy. Um, <laughs> Michael was always, he had the legs. Um, <laughs> he, he has the legs, I see. Yeah, yeah, we always used okay. to tease him that he had good legs. Um, <laughs> my, Michael also was extremely artistic and talented. There's no okay. question. Um, and he he was, uh, I would say, without question, Marlene's favorite. Um, beyond Michael, um, Paul, who's seven years younger than me, um, has always been sweet Paul to Marlena. Um, he's, uh, you know, my mother loves all four sons the same. Michael passed away, unfortunately. I know, I read it. Um, which Sorry. was, you know, a stupid thing. Let me tell you and your readers something that the doctor told me. Mm-hmm. When I went down to Tulane when Michael was dying, Michael had had a bump on the head and he'd gone to the hospital and they said, oh, you have a small concussion, you're okay. And two two days later, Two, no, sorry, two weeks later, the bleeding killed him inside. And the doctor poking me in the chest says, any head injury after the age of 30, you are bleeding in your head. Go get a CAT scan. Any head injury. He's poking me in the chest when he tells me this because he tried for six hours to save Michael and it wasn't successful. So that's my lesson for the day. Anyway, so then there's Paul, who who is very artistic himself. But really, Paul... Paul's one of those great human beings who just wants to help other people. And currently he's in Thailand and he does translation for young kids and he works in the hospital when, when people can't speak Thai and English and he helps translate for them and holds their hand while they're dying. And he, he, Paul is just one of those good people. 
And the youngest one is David, who was involved in Hollywood and stuff like that. And he and his partner, his husband, they live in L.A. and they they do well. Um, they're they're fine. So, but oh, you know, me, me, I was always the uh, the macher. You know, I was always the guy. Hey, we need something done. Call Peter. You know, Marlena would call my wife because Marlena met my wife. I met my wife when I was 13. So we've been together a long time. And um, uh, Marlena always would call my wife and say, I need socks for the musicians in South Africa. And she'd have to go to Harrods and buy socks and send them. You know. <laughs> so we're always the people who have to do things. And it was just happenstance that I was able to be there when she passed away because Otherwise, it might not have been a very good event. Mm -hmm. I heard it in another interview. Yes. Michael is, uh, I mean, come on. I, I don't know if you've looked at Michael's career in movies. I did. I did. Yipes. Yes. Yes. Steven so Spielberg sure. at lunch one time in New York, he came into the restaurant I was in and he says, Peter, how are you? And we talk about it. And he said, your brother, I'm so angry at your brother. I said, oh, Christ, Steven's angry at Michael. And, and, and he brought, got a big smile and he said, he's the best art director I ever had. And then I made him a director as a thank you. And he made one TV show and then he never worked for me again. It's ridiculous. He should come back to me. And and, and, Tom, and Tom Toro, you know, on Django Unchained. It was his last movie, right? Yes. Yeah. And he said, this is the yeah. best art director I've ever worked with. He's the nicest human being, the most intelligent. I'm going to do 10, 15 movies with him. And then Michael died. May he rest in peace. That's so sad. Um, hey, he did good on this earth. A lot of people can't say that. He did. He did. He absolutely did. Talking about your father, your father, William Weaver. What's your father's relationship with his mother-in-law? Well, I tell you, what do you think? <laughs> first of all, you should know that my father was, uh, his father was anti-fascist. Um, his father was the partner of Henry Ford building Ford factories around Europe in the 20s and 30s. Ah, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was taken to see the house that they lived in in, in Rome when they lived in Rome in, in the late 20s, early 30s. And currently it's the French embassy. So you get the idea of the different kind of uh. life. And um, <laughs> my father always seemed to be a very plebeian kind of person. He wasn't snobbish or anything else, but he had impeccable manners. Um, because he was brought up properly um, in a society that was different. Henry Ford and my grandfather split up in 36. Um, my grandfather stayed in Italy to work with Lancia, his best friend from school, and they were going to build a factory together. Um, and Mussolini then wanted him to build munitions factories. And my grandfather was anti-fascist. Uh, he was an American, born in, in Torino, but became American and was proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. So he was totally anti-fascist and Mussolini wanted him to build a factory and my grandfather wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So they arrested Lancia and started to mistreat the Lancia family to put pressure on my grandfather. So my grandfather sent my father, his older brother and my grandmother secretly on a train to Switzerland. Then they made their way to England and back to Detroit. And when he found out that they were back in Detroit safely, he took a shotgun and shot himself to stop the pressure from Mussolini because he was under house arrest. He couldn't go anywhere. So okay. um, my father, as soon as the war broke out in Europe, went uh, he was he was at university at that time. Um, he was 20. He'd been at university a year, a year and a half. And he mm -hmm. went and enlisted in, in the U.S. Army. And they put him in the U.S. Army Air Force because he spoke languages. And so they sent him down to Florida where he was learning how to run a factory that builds radar. He, they knew that his father was a, did factories, so they figured mm -hmm. my father could do a factory. So before, the, before Pearl Harbor, my father was secretly sent to England, to Coventry, to run this factory building radar units. And that's where he stayed until 1944. And he was top sergeant. They kept on wanting to make him lieutenant and captain. He said, no, I'm no, I'm, I'm the top sergeant. I run this place. I don't want to have the responsibility. I just want to do the job. And he said, anyway, 
the captain takes orders from me. I send him to, to London for grapes for my girlfriend. What the hell have I want to be a captain for? <laughs> so, so that's my father. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So some genius, stupid guy um, in uh, the military when they're preparing for D-Day says the oldest, the, sir, the old soldiers who have been here the longest are going to have the honor of being the first on the beaches of Normandy. Now, my father had 200 guys working for him, none of whom held a gun. None of them had any knowledge of fighting. Suddenly, they're, take, they're shipped down to, to Southampton, and he's in charge of like 30 guys, mm -hmm. training quickly how to even load a gun and all that kind of thing. And while he's down there loading the ships and the rain was coming and they take the cargo off and they put the cargo back on, a crate mm -hmm. fell and broke his arm. And so he has a plaster cast. Now, in those days, they were plaster, remember? Yeah. You couldn't get them wet. Yeah. So when it's landing on Normandy, he can't go in the boat because he can't get wet. So he's on the des destroyer, and he sees a shell hit the landing craft and kill everybody in his troop. And he's standing at the rail, cursing and swearing in the six languages that my father spoke. Because he, they'd been in Romania, they'd been in Spain, they'd been in Italy, they'd been in France, and so on. So he spoke all these languages, and he's cursing in all these languages. Mm -hmm. There's a guy standing next to him at the rail, who's a captain at the time, McCleary. And McCleary looks at my father and says, how many languages do you speak? And dad says, I don't know, five, six, something like that. The guy says, your guy's all dead? He said, yeah, you're with me the rest of the war. For the rest of the war, my father drove a jeep for this intelligence officer in and around the enemy lines. And because of that, he saw two conferences, two, two performances by Marlena and, and Danny Thomas. So he had met her in the Second World War and admired her. As one of her boys, actually. Yeah, as one of her boys. So when my mother, ah, great. flash forward, my father is, comes back from the war, takes a teaching job at Fordham University doing set design because he's artistic. Mm -hmm. My mother goes to Fordham University to teach acting and directing. They meet, they fall in love. It's instantaneous, 1947. It's go, go, go. They get married. Mm -hmm. Marlene is thrilled that she's gotten married. And she meets dad. And he's, he never tells her that he saw her perform in Europe. He purposely didn't. And why? Because I think um, there would be a very good connection between them. No, no, there was a reason. I'll tell you why. In a okay, I see. So, <laughs> so he doesn't tell her that he saw her perform and how great she was. Because you see, where Danny Thomas and Marlena performed um, sometimes were small events and sometimes very large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My father had seen her go with soldiers. He knew that she was um, sleeping with... There for entertainment, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so he wasn't going to embarrass her by telling her that he knew that she was <sighs> talking about talking about good manners. That's really impressive. <laughs> exactly. But but you know, he she was wonderful and nice to him and everything else, and they got on fine because he was in the arts. He was a scenic designer and getting paid good money. He did television commercials and Broadway stuff and charity things and so on. But he never used her. He never said, I'm Marlena's son-in-law. He never, ever claimed that. He, he wasn't interested in any of that connection. Uh, that's Maria's problem, as mm -hmm. he used to put it. Mm -hmm. And mom's career was taking off on television. She was the number one television female actress. Um, she mm -hmm. uh, Exactly. The head of CBS, uh, Bill Paley, told me at dinner one time, He said, my, your mother was my favorite television actress, the best actress we had on television. And I said, that's a very kind thing to say. And I'd heard it before from people like Jack Lemmon and Roddy McDowell and Omar Sharif and people like that who all thought Marlena wow. was yes. brilliant. Amazing. And, and I said to him, but why was she so, I mean, you're the head of CBS. Why would you even know her name? He says, no, you don't understand. I could call Marie on Wednesday morning, send the script over by a messenger, She would know the entire script by rehearsal Wednesday afternoon for live TV on Thursday night. He said, that is worth money in the bank. <laughs> so, <laughs> good point, actually. So, so you know, and, and she did a wow. good job. I, I, I've seen a few things of hers that are kind of, eh, you know, they're old fashioned and they're okay. 
But the comedy she did with Carol Channing, you see that on YouTube. That's hysterical. I like that a lot. The two of them <laughs> sing to Peter Lorre, and, and, and that's funny. So, you know, mom had a career going and everything. And she always wanted, she wanted six sons. And I'm the second. John Michael was first. John Peter second. John Paul and John David. My mother and father had this French thing of Jean-Pierre, Jean-Michel and all that in their heads. <laughs> it's caused a nightmare for all the brothers and entire <laughs> lives because I'm John P. Riva and my younger brother is John Paul Riva. So he's John P. Riva mm. and he gets phone calls for me. I got okay. uh, So anyway, that. she said, well, I, you know, doing this, it's 1956 and it was moving. Television was moving from New York to Hollywood. And my mother said, I'm not making that jump. I'm not changing because I know what living in Hollywood is going to do to the family. It's going to rip it apart. Your father and I will break up because mm -hmm. Hollywood's pressure is different from New York sophistication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she says, right, I'm giving up television. And that was not the greatest thing for her to do. She should have kept doing Broadway because she was great on Broadway, but she wanted to have children. So she got pregnant with Paul and, and, never went back to acting except once um, Dick Donner, who back in the early fifties, Dick Donner was a, an assistant on a television series that she did called playhouse 90. And they were great friends. And you know, Dick Donner made a lot of great movies. I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, anyway, the last movie that he was doing with my brother was called Scrooge. And he wanted somebody to play Robert Mitchum's wife. So he convinced oh, yeah. my mother, he Your mother convinced had my mother part. to play yes. Robert Mitchum's wife, which was very that. embarrassing for my mother. But <laughs> kind of cute. Mr. John Peter Weaver, I'm afraid that we need another 12 hours. So <laughs> let's go on with my five questions. And I'm very curious. <laughs> Number one. Cut out everything I've said. No, no, no. Uh, on the important uh, stuff. Go ahead. No, <laughs> of course not. So maybe I can use three or four part of it. So three episodes from one interview. There you go. Yes. How fine is the line between to have a desire to finally reveal a new info of Marlene to, to the world and yet to withhold the info because it's very private? Do you experience those kind of no, no, but, situation? But, no, but, but, but Matthias, Marlene doesn't belong to me. Mar Marlena belongs to her fans. I mean, I tell you, currently, you know who I'm really angry about? I mean, really angry is Facebook. We had a Marlene Dietrich Facebook page there with 540,000 followers. Yeah. And Facebook allowed it to be hacked, not once, not twice, three times. With mm -hmm. all the safeguards, they can't possibly hack you. It was hacked, and now they've taken it down, and they won't put it back. That That's the kind of thing that makes me angry, because those fans had a right to have a place where they could celebrate Marlena, where if I find a photograph, so, the other day somebody found a photograph of Maria and and and, um, and Judy Garland at my mother's birthday party. I mean, I'd never seen that photograph. Wow. Before. What a wonderful thing to put that on. Nope, 540,000 fans are never going to see it. Not for me. They'll find it somewhere else. But you know what I mean? It's... It, If there was no profit in it to have a Facebook page with 540,000 people. Nobody was putting advertising or anything else on. It was just for the fans. But Facebook doesn't care about that. If they're not making money, mm -hmm. they don't give a damn. And I think fans need it because uh, even on Instagram, there is no a big Malena Instagram profile or account. I so. try, I'm trying to do that. But the way Instagram works, it, it's, it's here and gone. Where to mm -hmm. go? I don't know where, you know, I mean, that's, That's not Marlena's world. Marlena's world is, you want to know something? I'm happy to tell you. Maria put everything in the book. There mm -hmm. were 300 pages she wrote that never made it to the book because they had to cut it down a little bit. More costume fittings and things like that. Nothing sensational. But interesting, you know. So, yeah, yeah I mean, if you go up to the film museum in, in Berlin, by the way, they've renamed it, the, the you know, whatever, the, they have a, a name for that museum. You know, the Deutsche Kinematik? Nein. Please. Yes. I mean, it, it should have been called a film museum Berlin, period, end of discussion. Everybody in the world would know what that oh, means, no, including it's, uh, Germans. The Deutsche Kinematik and Marlene Dietrich Collection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go there because what they have know, is wonderful. Yeah. It's a great museum. And the people are nice. And like you and your mother, I'm a supporting member of the Kinematik too. So, or as we say it here, uh, Fördermittlich. Yeah, Silke Ronenberg is one of the nicest human beings you'll he ever is. meet. 
He is. She's wonderful. She's great. And, and Werner Sudendorf, who's retired, is also my brother, as far as I'm concerned. He's a great person. So he you is. were asking me, what would you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine, because you already answered that next question. What was the last thing you found out about your grandmother? What was unknown to you or even surprised you too? So you're talking about that picture with Judy Garland at your mother's birthday. Yeah, there, there's always something that surprises me. You know, somebody just put a YouTube thing uh, they found of Noel Coward and Marlena singing in Paris with a U.S. Army orchestra in 1945. I mean, it's, I'll send you the link. It's like, really? Who okay. the, where did you find that? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's not very good singing because it's a, a military band, you know, and they go, oompa, 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, it's, it's historic and fun, you know. I can imagine how refreshing it must be to learn something new about your own family. So tell me, is there anything from Marlene's life that you miss completely? Any particular period, time period? To be honest with you, the, is there the, time, the, the time of Marlene that, that is, seems to be lost in time. Um, Max Kolpe used to talk about the time they spent at Cap Tantibes. Cap Tantibes is one of those, I, I suppose, in the top 10 hotel resorts in the world. And it, in the 30s, it really was for the most rich, the most famous to be open and casual and, and together. And so I, I'd love to, he spoke about it fondly. And I wish, you know, if I had a time capsule, I'd love to know more about that period of time, simply because the talent that, you know, there's a few photographs of Marlena with people there and you look at the talent between Eric Maria Remarque and the Kennedys and the this one, and then you go, <laughs> just to sit and listen and talk to these people would have been great, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. And you met a lot of them, by the way, Remark, Gabon. I have. I, I have. I, I've been very lucky. Um, you know, Harold Arlen and all those people in New York in the 50s. Uh, Jack Lemmon used to come to the house. And every time Jack Lemmon came in the house, my brother and I would be there to say hello politely, as children do. And yeah. we'd say, how do you do? And he said, Jack Lemmon. Call me Jack. And we said, <laughs> Mr. Lemmon, we know who you are. And he says, no, no, <laughs> saves confusion later. Every time he say the same thing. Put his hand out and say, hi, Jack Lemmon. <laughs> you know, he was just a sweet guy. They, they were nice people. Uh, Rod Steiger was a nice um, sort of joke jokester. And now, Hemingway never came to our house for dinner, but we'd go over to Marlena's apartment and Hemingway would be there and we'd meet him there and Yul Brenner and people like that. You know, I'll tell you a little story. I've told it before. I hope I'm not boring your, your, your people. Not at listening. all. Michael and I went to a boarding school in Switzerland, in, in, up in Gestad. There's a hotel called the Palace Hotel. And Marlena went there to sing one night. When she was asked by Noel Coward, why are you singing at the, the Gestad Palace? She said, somebody has to pay the school bill. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, That's great. Yeah. Which, which, which got back to us at school, which was a little... And which was true, right? You know, it was true... Except that you got to remember that Maria was working five days a week to keep Marlena's career on the right track with the right people and make the right contracts. And she never, you know, so. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my mother worked her ass off and, and stopped Marlena making a lot of serious mistakes as far as music and performance and where is concerned. Anyway, Michael and I were at the at the, the Gestad Palace bar, which is a big open platform with a You can look out over the snow. It's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there were maybe 500 people in this room all talking and everything before you go in and watch her sing. And at one end of the room is Noel Coward. And Michael and I are by the bar. We're having Coca-Colas. And everybody's talking. There's Gunther Sachs, Brigitte Bardot, the Taylors, as, as Marlena called them, the Taylors, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. All Elizabeth those Taylor, were, yeah. <laughs> my, Marlena always called them the Taylors. Um, <laughs> and, and a small door a servant store all the way at the far end of the room opens and a wave of silence comes all the way through the room and everybody goes quiet. She steps into the room and it's like the red sea, these people, the richest people you can imagine part company like this. And she walks down the middle till she gets to Noel Coward. He opens his arms and goes, Marlena, as he always did. <laughs> and then every, the, the Red Sea came back together. And Michael and I looked at each other and we went, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just a presence without saying anything, no announcement. And when you're living in that company, you're always 
aware of it. And also remember that five minutes with Marlena was like two hours with a normal person because it was always that level of intensity and intelligence and even to you or oh, yeah. to you or for friends or for uh, to everybody to everybody okay to everybody i mean it and she was away of that and she did enjoy it right it's, it's like the queen you know it's I, i i've had the i've never met the the, the, the queen of england um, my mother my father and and marlena did but i met margaret and those people uh, but there's a <laughs> sure. something there's something about There's something about their position in the world. I, yeah. I, to give you, an, I was waiting to see the the Secretary General uh, Boutros Boutros Gallery uh, Gallery uh, Boutros Boutros Gallery at at the UN, and I was sitting in the antechamber where the secretaries are, mm -hmm. and also sitting in the room was the the Dalai Lama, and we were wow. talking. Normal guy, absolutely lovely human being, peace Nick, great guy. The secretary comes in and says to the Dalai Lama, the Secretary General will see you now. He stands up and I swear to you, this glow appeared around him and everybody in the room, 20 or 30 people in the room, instantly quiet as he put on the persona of the mm -hmm. Dalai Lama and went to see the Secretary General. I can't tell you what that is, but Can very I describe few it? Yeah. have it, mm -hmm. but it's there. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've seen it before and it, it's quite it's quite interesting. Marlena seeing Princess Margaret at, in Drury Lane at the end of her performance. Princess Margaret curtsied to Marlena before Marlena could curtsy to her. Are you kidding me? That's I'm not. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not. Now, you have to remember that Marlena had Margaret on her lap when she was a child. You know, so it's not like Margaret didn't have a relationship with Marlena. But my father, who had good manners, knew exactly yeah. how to greet mm -hmm. Her, mm -hmm. her Highness. Mm -hmm. But to see Margaret curtsy to Marlena before Marlena and Marlena immediately bows, bows down and lifts her up. So, no, 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 you don't bow to me. You know, I mean, it, it was really okay. <laughs> Maybe you know, it sort yeah. of puts things in perspective. That's, yeah, I don't know if I have to say it's strange, it's weird, it's fascinating, of course. And yeah, I never get that story. So thanks for sharing. And your mother, Maria Riva, once said on German TV, Marlena didn't want to be a model, but she thought she was and i think one of the saddest songs is from the last song of uh, just a gigolo where she sings there will come a day and youth will pass away what will they say about me when the end comes i know there's just a gigolos life goes on without me and it was during her time in paris that the real marlene muth was born i think when she withdrew completely from the public eye how would you describe be careful your grandmother of. to a marlene dietrich fan well but here's the thing you have to be careful of she didn't withdraw from the public she withdrew from the public eye which you said was correct she withdrew from the, from public the eye, eye of the public yes listen i paid her phone bills five thousand dollars a month I had that. I'm talking to people all over the world for yes. hours, telegrams, letters, fan mail. Yeah, but she said, "Why would why would I destroy what took 80 years to achieve? That would punish people. I'm not into punishing people. People have a vision of Marlena today. They see a movie of hers in Russia, and 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 they write to Marlene Dietrich as if she was still right here, right now, because." What she did on screen was so moving to them that mm -hmm. they can't believe that she's not here anymore. Mm -hmm. That legacy is still here. That legacy should continue. You know, people use the word star and legend and icon. They use all these words. None of them have a lot of meaning. What is true with Marlena is that she stood for something. She still stands for something. And that legacy will continue. And it should continue because the best parts of Marlena are worth celebrating. The best parts of Marlena are are worth having an example. You know, uh, yeah. a wonderful senator for culture for the city of Berlin, um, Ulrich uh, Kolos Moman, he, he phoned me up after we were doing the storage thing in New York. And he mm -hmm. said, Peter, I need the anti-Nazi back in Berlin. And I said, I'm sorry. And he said, Germany is reuniting. And half the country has no example of mm -hmm. a good German who's mm -hmm. world famous, who wasn't a mm -hmm. Nazi. Mm -hmm. Would Can you bring Marlena back to Berlin? And that's why the collection went to Berlin. It wasn't 
to to say, oh, she's more German than American or more French than German or what. None of that matters. She's a world citizen, but she's stuck by her principles at a time when it would have been much more financially viable, much more famous if she had stayed in Germany. Mm -hmm. She chose the path that was right and made the best of it. That example is still a good example for people to learn in every country, not just Germany, every country. We're facing now, you and I, Matthias, be careful. All over the world, there's a movement to authoritarianism again. Yes, it is. You see it in Hungary. You see it in, in, in Belarus. You see in it Poland. in Russia, certainly. Yeah. We had Trump for four years. Let's yes. put that in context. Mm -hmm. And that isn't over yet. People think it's over. It ain't over yet. Mm -hmm. I see you. These dangers are here. And Marlena standing as an example of the exact opposite. And my grandfather standing as an exact example of the opposite is valuable to people. Mm -hmm. And I hope that people learn from it. I do. Because otherwise, the future is bleak. So let me um, adjust my question. So maybe, how do you think, is it even possible to describe your grandmother, the grandmother Marlene, to a Marlene Dietrich fan? Is it even necessary? Yeah, it's it's is this... it's not really possible. You know, mm -hmm. when, when, when something <laughs> is unique, how the hell do you describe it? Yeah. That yeah. would mean I have to be intelligent enough to understand what unique means. I, I don't. I just accept it for what it is. I read the, I read Maria's book. I look at the photographs. I look at her movies. You know, some of her movies, some of her movies she's performing in. Some of her movies she's acting in. Very few that she's acted in. I mean, if you look at the Blue Angel, she's a wonderful actress in that. She wonderful is wonderful actress, but not she very is. good performer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You look at Morocco, genius performer. Yeah. All the movies with Von Sturm and all that later on, genius performance. Hang on a second. Then you get to a movie she made with Orson Welles. And when you see the director's cut, wow, what an actress. The movie she made with Hitchcock. Of course, they didn't nominate her for an Oscar because it would reveal that she played two parts in the movie. And, uh, but the fact is, when she wanted to be an actress, she was damn good at it. When she wanted to be a performer, she was excellent at it. Um, when she went to be a singer with a very narrow range, you know, her range was, mm -hmm. was very small, mm -hmm. but she mm -hmm. got the most out of it she could. Mm -hmm. For her, you do it 100% or don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is such a difference between the blonde Venus and a foreign affair. Yeah. There, there's such a difference. So that's why I was talking about the uh, Sternbergs Marlene because of her most famous light shadow face and her like performing and acting like for, uh, with all of four Billy Wilder for example Austin Wells and Hitchcock yeah that's uh, fascinating. yeah the problem yeah. with Billy Wilder there was always a problem making movies with Billy Wilder because they're chums they're pals they 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 had the same Berlin gallows humor they were spent the whole time laughing on set so you know <laughs> She she was never all that proud of those movies because she realized that she didn't put 100% in it because she didn't mm -hmm. have the antagonism. Mm -hmm. Marlena worked very well with antagonism. Mm -hmm. Orson Welles understood that. Mm -hmm. And he, well, he, the best antagonist she ever had was Kramer, you know, when she did Judgment at Nuremberg. I mean, that performance is absolutely impeccable. It's With Spencer Tracy, yes. But it was Spencer Tracy who got her to say that line because she was never going to mm -hmm. say that line. We don't mm -hmm. know. You can't believe we do. Yeah. She, she couldn't, it just yeah. she couldn't say it. Right. Yeah. And Spencer mm -hmm. went over to her and he convinced her. He said, Marlena, the whole movie hinges on you saying that everything in this movie hinges on you saying that you have to say it. And they yeah. forced her to say it. And it was hard for her. I mean, frankly, she had days of depression after saying that days. Wow. My mother had to talk to her and so on. And, and you yeah. know, it, it was very hard for her. There was a, a nice woman in Paris called Jeanette Spanier who ran uh, Balmain, uh, Balenciaga and Balmain. Mm -hmm. And Jeanette Spanier um, put her arms around Marlena and hugged her while she was crying, having to say that line. That line was painful for her. Painful. That's why she's a magnificent person during the Second World War and after it. And um, at the Deutsche Kinematik, there is a whole room just for Marlene singing Illusions for uh, for an affair with her uh, soldier dress and the, the dresses from the movie. 
and um, yeah, it's fantastic. So, but Billy put that in because he knew that he had to give her that, or she wasn't going to do the movie. Yeah, and she was thinking the wounds of Berlin in three languages: a German, a French, and an English. So uh, this. Great. So in your family, there are so much uh, talents, Marlene, of course, and your mother. You are a writer, I said uh, before. I had and fun. Uh, your brothers are <laughs> partly in the film business. How fulfilling is it to have a success as a Reva that does not revolve around your grandmother? Well, you know. Yeah, because Reva is not Dietrich. No, God, no. Um, yes. It, it, it's um, the only good thing about the genetics here is that um, I'm 71 and I look like I'm 60. So that, there you go. That's, so that's true. Right. That is true. Even if it's a podcast, I can say that's true. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, the fact is that um, I decided early on in life, I, I had the privilege of going to a wonderful school in Switzerland, truly wonderful school. And it, it put me in contact with people from every nationality, every corner of the world. I don't. I, I am an American citizen, but I think of myself as a citizen of this planet. I'm as equally comfortable in Nairobi and that's so great, and Tokyo and and somewhere. You know, it, none of it bothers me at all. I, I love people everywhere. But I decided early on that if I'm going to do something three times in my life, I have to be at the vanguard, at the very top of possibilities. And and I've done in my life. I've been fortunate enough to be involved with projects and people where we've achieved some change on the planet um, and worked hard at it. Um, I negotiated the first global environmental treaty between the USA and the USSR in 1990. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I did, um, I was a project manager, fundraiser, floor sweeper for the Voyager around the world flight um, in 1986. And um, we went, uh, twice as far as any aircraft had ever gone on this planet without stopping, without refueling. And a lot of the technology we did in the mid 80s is now being put on aircraft wow. and making them more efficient and cheaper. And, and more people can travel on this planet, the more people can go and see, you know, can you imagine, Matthias, having a war against America anymore or Americans having a war against Germans? No, we all know each other. Yes. The politicians can try and pull that bullshit, but we're not interested. Yes. And, yes. and I think Putin knows that, by the way. He, mm -hmm. His job is to undermine the financial security that we have so that he becomes more powerful. But he has no desire to take over Germany anymore, none, or Poland or anything else, because he can't fool all the people all the time. And we all know what it's like to be in Poland and, and to be in Czechoslovakia and, and uh, Yugoslavia as was. Mm -hmm. And similarly... You know, could I imagine fighting anybody from Burundi, Uganda, uh, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia? No, I feel sorry for those people when they're in trouble. Why? Because they're all the same. We're all on the same damn planet. We're all the same. And this yeah, notion same. of of racism has just got to stop. It's such yes. bullshit. Yes. Racism, sexism, misogyny, all of that. Just st stop. Yes, I hear you. Amen. Yeah. It's nuts. I mean, you see, the thing is, Marlena, even when I was a kid, you know, she would she would um, she would make fun of, you know, oh, he's that he's really a fagula, you know, saying the guy is gay and everything else. Mm -hmm. But she didn't mean it like I don't like him because he's gay. She would mean, yeah, he's way too effeminate. You know, he's just got to calm down a little bit. And she would say to about a guy, what, what does he think he is, an ape? He should behave better because he was too machismo you know i mean you could have those conversations it's not pc anymore but you could have those conversations because you weren't at base racist you weren't at base misogynist nowadays it's a little bit more difficult to thread the line because people get upset very quickly yeah but it's so difficult because you talk about people not with people and that's that's it yeah that's it it's it's kind of like police form in the united states mm -hmm. we're, we're we're trying to change the police by telling them instead of working with them to help them yes change. exactly agree 100 percent. yeah yeah and and that has to happen everywhere in the world and marlena mm -hmm. knew that she she knew that she, she what she was trying to do was in the second world war she was trying to stop nazism and using any tool that was available to her But she went and visited German soldiers in the hospital. People don't remember that. Mm -hmm. For her, there was no distinction between a soldier and a soldier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He 
you were just on the with the wrong ideas, the wrong mentality. Don't be that way. Mm-hmm. Stop, you know, being authoritarian. And the world the way it is, I mean, at times I think she's spinning in her grave. But, you know, what can I do? <sighs> she is, I think. So I will come to my last question. So, wow, the time is running. <laughs> What's already so good in your life right now that you want more of to happen? Let's end this interview with something good. Well, the good thing is my wife had cancer and she's been five years clear now. And I'm hoping that we can go to our old age and die within a day. Oh, that's good. Time. Good to hear. You know? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I see. I've known, I'm, I'm 71 and Sandy and I started dating when we were 13 and got <laughs> married at 22. And uh, that's a love story. So I think we need a, just an extra interview to talk about that. <laughs> actually, the funny part of that is that uh, when I told Marlena that I was getting married and she said, Sandra. And I said, yes, she says, good. You're marrying up. <laughs> <laughs> you're marrying and, she, up. and she's right of course she's right but we, you know I, i don't i don't tell my wife that too often because then she'll boss me around more but the, the truth is marlena always said i was marrying <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you i think you're just a healthy happy person right now I try and be, I try and be, you know, yeah. life can be hard. The COVID has been really hard for everybody mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not over. People wear masks for God's sake, just wear a mask. Even if you've had vaccination, wear the mask, be Japanese, yes. pretend yes. you're Japanese, yes. be fashionable and wear a mask. And if somebody says, why are you wearing a mask? Say, I'm doing this to protect you. I may have COVID and watch them move away. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's true. Just, The, the the variant that's coming out of South America, Lambda is coming now. You know, we've had Delta. Now Lambda is coming. It ain't over till it's over. Yeah. And and I, I beg people just to realize that the possibilities yeah. here. And the whole world is affected. So it's not a United States problem or a Poland or a Germany problem. The whole world is affected by that. The truth yeah. is, you know, Marlena would never have gotten COVID because it wouldn't dare. <laughs> <laughs> Should this be the last sentence of this interview? I'm not sure yet, but this is really great. <laughs> to be honest with you, when, when Marlena died, my mother said, are we doing an autopsy? And I said, Mom, we're not doing an autopsy. She said, you know, medical science should do an autopsy. How is it possible that she's still alive? And I said, what do you mean? She said, Peter, she's drinking half a bottle of scotch and a bottle of champagne at least every day. And she's taking suppositories to go to sleep, another one to wake up and then... When we packed up her apartment, we put all her medication in a box and I sent it to the Deutsche Kinematik. And I said to oh, them, really? It's at the yeah. Deutsche Kinematik. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I said, you, you cannot destroy this until a pharmacist has gone through and written everything that's in there. Oh, I see. And the, phar the pharmacist <laughs> report, because they had to destroy it because it's medicines, you know? Yeah. I mean, serious medicines. Okay. 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 Um, and um, <laughs> the pharmacist report ended with, I have no idea how anybody could take all these medicines and still be alive. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother was right. If we'd done an autopsy, maybe we'd have learned something scientific, but it's okay. That's amazing. Yeah. Mr. Weaver, thank you so much for Peter, your time. Call me Peter, a... for goodness sake. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you really, really, really so much for your time. I could listen to your stories for hours. Maybe we should do a daily podcast. Maybe with your mother. I can talk to your agent, by the way. No, it was really fun. And um, I'm really grateful because I was able to uh, buy a photo of Marlene and of Douglas Fairbanks, which was in her New York apartment till 92 from you for a good cause. Thank you so much. And my last question, by the way, is, was I successful to ask you unique questions? That's the most important thing. Yeah. Really? A friend. Look, a friendly <laughs> conversation dealing with the truth and having trust in somebody who's asking the questions means that you talk, tell everything. And if I forget something, I'd be happy to tell you again. <laughs> I mean, it's rare. But Mostly people have an agenda. You don't have an agenda. You just want to have a nice conversation about the truth. It's fine with and me. the truth. Yeah. And try to make it very kind, respectful and not like uh... the truth is always more interesting than the bullshit. 
It is, it is. And the truth will always reveal. I hope so. Thanks very much. And I have this on record. So we will talk again and uh, have a very great day in the States. Say all the best uh, to your mother. I'm a huge fan and a I huge will. fan of yours. I read your books. I've told you. And dear guests, thanks for listening. And we will see us or hear us next week on Friday to a Mats Up Podcast. Vielen Dank. Auf Wiedersehen. <lacht> Auf Wiedersehen. Mats Up. Klappe, Ecke, die erste. Hallen, hallen. Jo. Mann, du bist gefeuert. <lacht> Ich war noch in der Probe schreien. <lacht> Mats ab. Ah.